Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and today I'm going to be telling you about two more invasive species here in Virginia. Now, as we remember, an invasive species is one which is not native to this area, but one that was introduced by humans, whether unintentionally, like our first species today, or intentionally, like our second species today. And having been introduced, Invasive species are ones that become established, able to reproduce on their own, and then become problematic. That's what makes them invasive. Thousands of species are introduced all over the world in different places where they are not native and they do not cause problems. Those few that do, we call invasive species. So here I'm by the edge of a trail and also in a riparian area. You can hear the water in the stream behind me. And trail sides and stream sides are some of the worst places for microstigium invasion. And you can see here in the winter that microstigium um, turns just brown, almost whitish brown. And we can take a handful of these up. And we'll take a, a little bit of a closer look at some of the dead ones so that you can see their features. So here's the root system on one of those dead Japanese silk grass pieces. You can see it doesn't have a lot of root. These ones are, are pretty long, but there's not much to them, which is why it's pretty easy to, to pull up out of the ground. And then it will have these little stilt roots coming off further up from the nodes. The nodes are those raised knuckle-like pieces of the grass stem. So these are the stilt roots from which it gets its name coming off further up, which is why the stilt grass can kind of um, run along the ground and um, spread um, horizontally. And then when we get up a little bit further, you can see that it will fork. It's not just a single stem, but it'll fork and have multiple stems um, with leaves from the nodes up here. And here is an image of a live sample showing that growth form. As you can see, the leaves of Japanese silk grass are up to four inches long and half an inch wide, pointed at both ends. The leaves are slightly hairy, especially on the upper surface, with a white or silvery vein running down the middle. Japanese stilt grass is also called Nepalese brown top, which is a little bit of an ironic name since it's not native to Nepal either, it's invasive there as well, and it's also called Chinese packing grass. We believe that it first came to the United States in packing material. Um, all of that material, kind of like you would pack something in straw, or we might use newspapers or shredded paper or, or styrofoam peanuts. Um, in the early 1900s, people um, in China that were sending China would wrap those or nestle those in beds of this grass. Um, and so that's how we think it arrived here in the United States, somewhere in the late 19 teens. Japanese stilt grass forms dense mats. It can grow more than three feet tall, although it doesn't normally grow straight up three feet, it normally will flop over. When it flops over, it can send out more roots from the nodes and so perpetuate itself horizontally in that manner. Japanese stilt grass is an annual plant, meaning that it only lives for one growing season. So when you see those large mounds of dead um, stilt grass at this time of year, those are, those are dead. They're not um, going to come back up from the roots. Um, they're finished. However, Japanese stilt grass is also a prolific seeder. An individual plant can put out a thousand seeds both uh, fertilized seeds near the end of summer, as well as in the early to midsummer, it actually will put out self-fertilized seeds from lower down on the plant where it's harder to uh, see them and control for them. So that prolific seeding and the fact that the seed can stay viable in the soil for three years or more is why it continues to be such a problem even though individual plants die at the end of each growing season. In addition to the prolific seeding, there are a few other reasons why Japanese stilt grass is so invasive. One is that it really loves disturbance. Any bare soil and those seeds can germinate and it 
is therefore very common along roads, trails, um, following behind logging and construction equipment, and also um, along streams and frequently flooded areas. It's relatively tolerant of flooding, and it is particularly tolerant of shade. Um, very few of our native grasses do well in shady settings. You don't see grass growing in the woods normally, but Japanese tilt grass grows quite well in the shade. It's also unpalatable to deer and also to cattle and horses and even goats. So in places where it is established, the deer um, don't really eat it or help to control it. And that puts the pressure of the deer browsing onto the native plants and can hasten uh, the spread of Japanese still grasses. Those native plants are preferentially eaten by the deer. The main problem with Japanese silk grass is that it does crowd out those native uh, early spring bloomers and it can also impact the regeneration of tree seedlings and shrubs. Um, obviously large established trees aren't really affected much by it, but seedlings are affected by it and so it can impact regeneration of a forest after natural or man-made disturbances. Japanese stilt grass is likely allelopathic. We learned about that before. It's where the plant secretes substances that impede the growth of other plants. One of the most important things that you can do to help combat Japanese stilt grass is to stop its spread. And it is a prolific seeder and those seeds very easily stick to clothing, stick to the mud in your shoes, land in your pant cuffs, and also stick to equipment like uh, logging and construction equipment, as well as ATVs and things like that. And so uh, making sure that you empty out your pant cuffs, brush off your, your pants and your shoes and clean your equipment can really help this um, this invasive plant from spreading to more areas. Even though Japanese silk grass is an annual, that seed bank that it builds up makes it really difficult to control. And the best way that people have found to control it is a combination of both manual control and use of herbicides. So manual control can include pulling, but also can include mowing and disking and weed whacking. Now you have to be careful because those activities also disturb the soil and disturbing the soil is a really good way to encourage Japanese stilt grass to germinate and to spread. They love disturbance. So those soil disturbing methods of control need to be done late enough in the year that the plants that arise in that disturbed area don't have time to mature. However, it's important not to do your control work too late. You don't want those plants to set seed because once they set seed, you're not doing any good by killing them. They're annuals. They're going to die anyway. It's that seed that you need to control. So you need to do your control work in like late summer where you are destroying the seeds before they mature, the plants while they're flowering preferably, but not too early so that they don't have time to uh, establish new populations in those disturbed areas. When I first learned about Japanese stilt grass, it was around the year 2000, and people were doing a lot of research into whether or not fire would be good for controlling Japanese stilt grass. All of those big, airy mounds of dead grass seemed like they would burn really well and that this might be an effective control mechanism. But we're seeing that fire can actually ha be counterproductive because it creates those bare, disturbed soils that cause the seeds to germinate um, and the plants to grow so well. So some kind of combination of mowing, trimming, plowing, disking, and an herbicide product seems to work best. Now most of the herbicide products that you might already have are probably geared towards controlling broadleafs and may not be very effective against grasses. A lot of the herbicides that we see marketed in stores are to control broadleaf weeds in your turf grass. So you wanna check those labels and make sure that whatever you have is effective against grasses. If it's selective to affect grasses and broadleafs less, so much the better because another really important component of this is establishing something in that space where the Japanese stilt grass was, preferably some kind of native ground cover. 
calorie pear is native to Asia and was first introduced to the United States around 1900 for use as breeding stock with the kinds of pears that we grow to eat because calorie pear is very resistant to fire blight, which is a bacterial infection that pear and other fruit trees get. Very quickly, people realized that they had the potential for a really popular ornamental tree here because it blooms very early in the spring, grows very quickly, and is resistant to many pests. And so they began to develop a cultivar that could be planted ornamentally, and the one they came up with they named Bradford. So you'll often hear all calorie pear trees referred to as Bradford pear trees because the vast majority of calorie pear trees that were planted in this country were the Bradford cultivar. Now Bradford pear trees are self-sterile. They cannot fertilize each other and produce viable uh, seed, viable offspring trees. And so for a long time the calorie pear was not a problem because it couldn't spread. The thing is though one of the characteristics that was bred into the Bradford pear was a really weak branching structure. And because of this, uh, plant breeders got to work on new cultivars that would have sturdier branches and not fall apart in storms and drop branches on people's cars. And so they came up with other, other varieties, other cultivars like Chanticleer and a bunch of others. And those can crossbreed with Bradfords. And so now you have fertile seed, you have um, you know, trees that will sprout and grow that are mixtures of these various cultivars of calorie. And some of them look very much like Bradford's. Some of them look very much like that original um, wild form of uh, calorie pear that grows in Asia. Some of these have thorns and um, they then can breed with each other as well as back with the uh, horticultural cultivars. And that's how Bradford pear or calorie pear became an invasive species problem in the United States. Calorie pear, especially the Bradford variety, tends to have a very egg-shaped crown. And as we get closer, you can see that weak branching structure. Lots and lots of branches coming up, lots of co-stems coming up from the same general spot, lots of branches crammed in together. And this is a weak branching form. Um, elms can do it, but they've had millennia to develop that form. When Bradford was bred to be this way, it um, does not have a strong branching pattern. And these branches will often fall apart in wind or ice storms, um, landing on the sidewalks and parked cars that they are planted near as city street trees. These are some of the dried up fruit of a Bradford pear. Um, from last uh, fall and they're a little bit dried up but even fresh they're not very big uh, the size of marbles or blueberries and very spherical. The wild type calorie pear will sometimes get a little bit bigger but not much and these are no good for eating uh, even after first frost they stay pretty uh, astringent. Bradford pear flowers are white and five petaled and appear before the leaves in early spring. Unfortunately, these flowers have an unpleasant odor. I only find it mildly unpleasant, but many people find it truly objectionable and a quick Google search will reveal the many unpleasant things that people compare this smell to. Like many of the invasive species that we've learned about, calorie pears have a longer growing season. You can see the two trees in this picture that are still green, even as the red maple between them and the sycamore behind them are changing color in the fall. Calorie pear leaves can stay green well into November before turning any color ranging from scarlet to a dark maroon and then persist on the tree well into December. Calorie pear is a problem because it forms dense thickets where nothing else can grow. And although birds do eat the fruit and pollinators will visit the flowers, the trees host very few caterpillars or other native insects, which are the basis of most food chains. The thorns can also be problematic where you have livestock or where you are trying to um, run any kind of a vehicle because they can puncture tires. 
A friend sent me this picture of calorie pears growing wild on the side of the highway at about this time last year. They can form much denser thickets. Calorie pear sprouts readily from the roots when cut down. So in order to control it mechanically, you really need to remove the whole root system. The alternative is to use herbicides, either a glyphosate or a triclopyr product. That can be applied to cut stumps, as a basal bark spray, or foliarly, including if you cut it down, allow it to sprout back and then spray the foliage. Fire is not an effective way of controlling Bradford pear and can actually exacerbate an infestation. Well, that's all I have for you this week. Please join us next week when Bill Worrell will take us on a tour of a sawmill.